Lord, thank you so much for calling us friends. Thank you for sharing who you are with us. Thank you for receiving our love. Thank you for giving us the ability to give it freely. I pray that you bless the remainder of this um, presentation. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Information theory. I call it evolution's Achilles heel because I can talk to an evolutionist and say, okay, I'll give you a million years. Okay, I'll give you infinite po probabilities. I'll give you multiple universes. I'll give you anything you want. You still can't explain this. In the beginning was the Word. I put information there in parentheses. And the Word was God, and the Word was... With God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. I put the word information there because the word, word <clears throat> logos, has many, many levels of meaning. There are Greek levels. There are Jewish levels. And what I want to focus on here is... <clears throat> The Word made everything, and you can't make anything without instructions. I had an epiphany in college, something that I realized, I was probably a sophomore or junior in college, and I realized, this is very embarrassing because most of you realize it when you were 10, okay? But I forget, I was riding in the backseat of someone's car coming back late from something in Virginia, and I was looking at all these big buildings, and it suddenly occurred to me, None of these buildings could exist without blueprints. That's a real duh moment, right? <clears throat> I said, every one of these buildings was in someone's head first. And <clears throat> it's something you know, but just realize that the instructions have to happen before the creation. The information has to happen before the manifestation. Mind precedes matter. Information. What is it? The Rosetta Stone is a good example of information. The top portion is Egypt, Egyptian hieroglyphs. The middle portion is Demotic script, and the lower was ancient Greek. It contains information. <clears throat> you can look at that and say, aha, those are symbols. I'll bet those symbols contain information. What is the information? I don't know. I can't translate those symbols. But I can tell you one thing. Those symbols were created by an intelligent source. Okay? Now, I can look at something and say, Was this, did this have an intelligent source or not? <clears throat> I'm not going to be wrong when I put it this way. If I, if I look at some characters and they look like, look like chicken scratch, I said, is this, is this a real language or is this just random dots on a paper? Now, if it is random dots on the paper, I will look at it and say, that's just nonsense. I'm never going to incorrectly look at it and say, no, that looks like intelligent information there. I could be wrong. But if I look at it, it's hard to say this right. If I say it's random chicken scratch, I could be wrong. I might not recognize the language, right? But I'm not, but if, if I say, yep, that's definitely intelligent design something, very unlikely I'm wrong because I have the ability to infer um, design in what I'm looking at. The only reason I'm going to be wrong is if it is intelligently designed or I have an intelligent source and I don't recognize it. Follow that? We can identify that it has an intelligence source. We don't know what the intelligence is. Nature can no longer be seen as matter and energy alone. <clears throat> now that right there is the foundation building block of secularism. This is their tenet of faith. The tenet of faith. We believe, as Carl Sagan says, that the universe is all that ever was and ever will be. That sounds like a Catholic mass more than a scientific statement. But... um or religious, liturgical. Um, and it just doesn't fly in today's modern computer age. You try to say, well, I think that the universe is more than just matter and energy. We can look at all sorts of things that prove that. There's design in nature, design. 
Remember how Michael was saying, I see God in everything. And the atheist says, I don't see God anywhere. It's familiarity. Okay? And does a fish know it's wet? Okay? <clears throat> The fish, fish goes, I don't, I'm not wet. I don't see any water. There's no water. I don't believe in water. And then when someone says, oh, there really is water all around you. I don't see it. <clears throat> I'm familiar with it. It's, I, just, I grew up with it. I grew up with seeing life everywhere. It seemed normal to me. You don't realize how abnormal it is with, compared to the rest of the universe. A third, component, a third component is needed for any explanation of the world that claims to be complete. To the powerful theories of chemistry and physics must be added a late arrival, a theory of information. Nature must be interpreted as matter, energy, and information. <clears throat> information must be encodable and decodable. In other words, I am encoding my thoughts into English. I am presuming that my audience can decode English but I'm using symbols. The words that I speak are symbolic of actual things. I say the word cat, there's nothing feline about that word, but the, a feline connotation comes into your minds because you've been taught that the, the sound cat means meow. Okay. <clears throat> so information cannot be dependent upon the medium. The medium is what, the inf is what holds information. This iPad holds the information. A piece of paper holds the information. Information is not dependent upon it. Information, the paper and the ink, don't determine what the content of the information is. It must be transferable between mediums. I must be able to take my information and copy it, and then fax it, and then send it in an email, and then paint it out. I can trans the information stays the same, although the medium can change. And finally, and this is the crux, it must have a desired effect upon the recipient. In other words, information must have a purpose. And that's kind of scary because only intelligence can devise a purpose. Okay? Just keep that in mind. There is a goal to information. <clears throat> You can have a goal and try to transmit information, but if you can't decode it, if I'm speaking the wrong language, the goal will not be realized. Five levels of information. Statistics, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, alphabetics. <clears throat> Go through those real quickly. Statistics simply gives us raw information about a, a string of information, a sentence. How many characters are in the text? <clears throat> or how many characters are in the language, if we're talking about a written language. Uh, how, what is the average frequency of any given character? So in English, if you watch Wheel of Fortune, E is the most common letter in English language, OK? Then you go to S and T's and all that. If you're decoding, uh, um, if you're trying to do a cipher or something like that, you need to know that. Noise versus content, and that means if I give you a, a string of letters, and some of them make words, and some of them are nonsense, <clears throat> so the, the statistics will tell you how much is nonsense or not. Or if I'm doing a radio broadcast, and interference is knocking out every other word, statistics will tell you how much data is getting through. This is from the Shannon theories of information. And the information content of a character Information content of a character is based on how much information it gives you. If I start out a word and I start out the word with B, that tells you that you can eliminate all the other words that don't start with B, OK? Then I give you the next letter, A. Oh, well, now, now, so each letter I give you gives you information about the word based on your knowledge of the words. And as I start to narrow it down, it's like a search engine. It starts filling it in for you and guessing. Um, <clears throat> information content of characters. Now, if I give you a cue, um, I, you have absolutely, in the English language, you have been given no information about the next letter, because it has to be a U. So that's just the. The statistics. 
The syntax are the rules of a given language or the selection of the codes or characters, um, arrangement and word order. Uh, these are the rules that let us know when a sentence makes sense or not. <clears throat> they just said it's going to rain on the radio. Okay, well, we have a problem with the uh, word order there. The prepositional phrase is out. Did the radio say it's going to rain or is the rain going to land on the radio? The birds sing to the song. The meaning there is perfectly clear, but we know that the rules have been violated. The green freedom prosecuted the celebrating house. No rules violated. Perfectly legitimate English sentence, <clears throat> but meaningless. Semantics. Now we're getting to the real meaning of the words, implied information, metaphors. Uh, metaphors are just you know, using examples. Sarcasm. In other words, when I say, you look lovely today, <clears throat> that's part of semantics. Um, allusion. This is something that is so hard to wrap your head around because Americans use allusion a lot. An allusion means you take a phrase and you're alluding to a common experience. Unfortunately, for America, um, it's, it's a little long. Someone's cell phone going nuts. Um, <laughs> um, unfortunately, for Americans, most of our common experience are movies. So we will use allusions. You know, um, I'll probably date myself, but I say, uh, go ahead, make my day. Um, that's an illusion. It carries information. It's not information that can be quantifiable. And you can come up with your own better examples. And then I put gift up here. I want you to imagine I have a box full of Scrabble letters. And I pull out a G. And you go, wow. And then I pull out an I, and I'm, I'm, I'm generating information. I'm putting together something that hopefully will mean something when I finish up. I get to the F, and I get to the T, and your mind goes, click. I recognize that. And you say, oh, information has been received, right? And now you know what I'm talking about, right? Unless I'm German. <laughs> that word means poison in German, OK? <laughs> So we have to have a meeting of the minds, have to be pre-agreed upon. Christmas time is a very nervous time in Germany when packages come from America. <clears throat> <laughs> Fragile gift. <laughs> okay. But the semantics, the, the meaning of the word. Now again, if I'm trying to convey information, I have to have a proper decoding mechanism. Yes, letters G-I-F-T, they could be pulled out randomly. Did I randomly create a word because I pulled out those four letters? Yeah, I did. But is it useful? No, because it might be the wrong language, or it might not be useful in the target language. <clears throat> Pragmatics, level four, the results of the information transfer. What actions are expected from the recipient? When I say, please close the door, I'm expecting that the person will close the door. I also am now I have to have some knowledge about what the recipient can and can't do, right? Um, if, if I have a computer program and I'm sending the program to tell a machine to do something, I'm counting on the machine having the ability to decode that and then do the proper, proper um, response. See, at this point, my initiation means that I, as the initiator, have a, have, a, have a purpose, I have a plan. I have to know how much flexibility is there in their response. I can ask someone to go work in my vineyard and they might say yes, but they're really not gonna do it. I don't know where that came from. Um, <clears throat> and then um, what's the purpose? Again, purpose, is, is my purpose to be instructional? Am I teaching something? Am I trying to build someone up? Am I trying to scare somebody? Am I trying to amuse somebody? All those are involved in the pragmatics of, of information. And then the apobotics is a very, very deep level. This is the ultimate intent or motivation of the sender. Um, I, could, I could send someone a kind of a funny story. 
and they read the story, and then it triggers something in their mind, and it makes them think about a childhood memory, and it really builds them up. And maybe my purpose for that funny story was to really edify somebody. And that funny story would have been ignored by anybody else. But I know you well enough so that my whole purpose for this funny little story is to, to um, edify. Um, it could be just seeing the final result or the big picture. Um, I give you an instruction. You do one thing. Someone else does something else. Someone else does something else. You don't know that all three of you together are going to be combining to produce what I really want. Advertising. That's all the intent. Yeah, I, I put the model on the motorcycle. My intent is not to tell you about models of motorcycles. My intent is to sell motorcycles. Could be just showing off. Could have false humility or false compassion. I'm talking about the real deep purpose for information being sent. Could also be deception. I could be giving you information, and, and I know that it's false information. And I'm doing it because my real response is, I want you to be afraid and give me all your guns, OK? Um, <laughs> apobotics continued. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. <clears throat> I can break that down to all five levels. You know, I can analyze the letters. I can analyze the meaning. I can analyze the language, the original language. I can analyze the purpose and intent, and then the whole apobotics is, I don't see the word peace in that sentence. What's the real intent? God wants us to be able to rest in that knowledge. God wants us to be able to go, OK, now I know. Now, if I'm going to take that verse and accept that, but not accept Genesis 1, you can see where the schizophrenia comes in that we were talking about earlier. But God's intent on this verse, the real meaning, the reason he put that verse in the Bible was to give us peace. The verse doesn't say, everybody have peace. The Bible is the only source of extra universal information. And I want to, that's one of my big, big things. The universe is here. The only way we can know anything about the universe is information from outside the universe. And the Bible is the only source of that. Is universe information from outside the universe. OK. Five levels demonstrated. The husband tells the wife, under no circumstances are you to open the wooden box in the basement. This is a command, OK? <clears throat> Statistically, yeah, well, there's how many O's, how many U's, there's one exclamation mark, um, there's some spaces. The syntax, yeah, it looks like a command, um, the word. Basement means down below, box. The semantics, you know, it's a wooden box. Um, it looks like, like it's um, a command. The pragmatics of it are don't open the box, right? That is the purpose of the sentence. The apobatics of this, and this is an actual court case from a while back that I read about, <clears throat> is he knew his wife would open the box when he said that. And he wired her to explode, and he killed her. Oh, OK? He was convicted of murder based on the apobotics of his command. I didn't tell her to open the box. She killed herself. I didn't do it. I wasn't me. I told her not to. I tried to save her life. No, you didn't. You knew your, your real motive, your real intention, was what happened. <clears throat> How is information generated? Information's defining characteristic is complexity. And that's <clears throat> when, you, when, you, when you see a written sentence, it is complex. It's complex because you can't predict what the next letter is going to be. You can guess on occasion, and when you have a full word, you can start to fill in the blanks. But as information is being generated, um, or as, as I'm picking sounds right now, I mean, there's a lot of sounds I could make. I'm only choosing these. <laughs> and the sounds that are being picked syllables. In order to gener generate information, one of three forms of complexity must be the result. There are three types of complexity. Random complexity, chance or chaos. If I blow something up, things fly randomly. Um, 
<clears throat> if I take my box of Scrabble letters and throw them up in the air and let them fall on the floor, whatever happens, happens. You cannot generate information there because there's no purpose. There's no plan. I might end up with a random word. I might end up with the word gift. But there's no purpose for that word, and there's no expected result from that word. Ordered complexity, natural laws. The best example are crystals. You take a certain chemical here, a chemical there, and then you add natural laws. You freeze the water, and they start following the rules. And then specify complexity requires intelligence. <clears throat> now, the reason ordered complexity doesn't work for information is because it's repetitive. If, um, if this chemical always connects to this chemical, and this chemical always connects to this chemical, it's not going to work. Like the letter U after Q, it contains no information. Because, well, duh, U's always follow Q's. I haven't learned more about the word when I give you the U. <clears throat> and then specify complexity is when it's very complex, but it's specific. The complexity is, been, is done deliberately. So instead of taking the letters out of, and throwing them up in the air out of the Scrabble box, I take them out and I start laying them out on a table and deliberately make a sentence. I am using my free will, which we'll get to later, to create sentences for the purposes of some sort of information. <clears throat> Random complexity creates noise, like static. Order complexity creates repetitive things over and over again, like crystals. Information, Morse code, smoke signals, language, bee dances. Now you think that's a little strange, but no. They they generate information about location of sun, location of flowers, how much pollen's available, and that's sent to the rest. Now, are they smart enough to generate that information? No. But that just points to the creative genius of the one that created their instincts. They're not smart to do it themselves, but they've been programmed to do it. So now we have a programmer who put into the bees the ability to do this. Hieroglyphics, and again, computer programmers, same thing. When they talk to each other, they have to use information designed by programmers. Now, <clears throat> if I'm talking, if I'm sending information to another intelligence or intelligent recipient, they can gauge, they can fill in the gaps, they can correct for mistakes, they can understand what I meant. If I try to do that to a non-intelligent recipient, like a computer, or a machine that needs a code, the second something's off, it breaks down completely, unless there's been programming to compensate for that. <clears throat> so back to the real issue of creation. The issue is, does DNA qualify as information? Well, if information must have an intelligent source, then we have a good reason for evolutionists to want DNA to not be information. We, they want DNA to be a complex chemical. Well, if it's a complex chemical, that means it's, it's ordered complexity, it's ordered by natural law. Um, Dr. Dean Kenyon wrote a book in the 50, 60s called Biochemical Predestination. This textbook it was in all the colleges. It showed, it claimed to show how chemicals slowly but surely can follow natural laws and become life, become DNA. It was, it was the textbook. And it, it was saying that DNA or instructions can, be, can, can come about by chemical predestination. <clears throat> and he has some students that said what I'm talking about here. He eventually renounced the whole book. He eventually said, I don't know how it happened, but it can't be this way because there's not, the ability to create information does not exist. He then started getting involved in some of the intelligent design movements, <clears throat> and he started speaking with them, and then eventually someone in that movement led him to Christ. And so he's quite hated in some circles. Once the researchers began to see that DNA contained compiled information, which was then translated by ribosomes to instruct the cell on which amino acids to collect to create proteins, it soon became apparent that DNA had to be added to this list of information. 
For example, there are no physical or chemical laws that say the letters cat equal to furry purring feline. It's a symbol. Okay? We've been taught to equate that symbol, and that's what intelligence is all about, is, is translating symbols into meaningful information, just like gift. <clears throat> Similar, the DNA message, GCT, it's a message. It doesn't, there's nothing in it that means alanine. There's nothing inherent in those characters, in those three chemicals that mean alanine. But it's a message that translates to that. So when those three, are, are three, three um, chemicals, or amino acids, are seen put together, the messenger goes out and picks alanine off the rack based on that information. It's purely symbolic. All observation tells us that all known examples of specified complex information require an intelligence or mind to generate it. There have been no ex experimental or laboratory examples of naturalistically generated specified complexity. Maybe a few too many big words there. The point is, is that if, we, if I'm talking to a scientist, I'll say, well, um, you believe in scientific method, don't you? Well, of course. So, have you seen in the laboratory examples of naturalistically generated information? And that means information that came about either by chaos, noise, or information that came about by natural laws. And I'm open to it. If, it, if, someone, can, if someone can demonstrate it, okay. But until someone has, we are left with, <clears throat> to date, the only source of information is intelligence. Yeah. Are natural laws a proof for intelligence? They would be, but not to them. Uh, natural law, um, for example, you have four fundamental forces in the universe. You have um, strong, weak, gravity, and electromagnetic. And those four forces supposedly emerged out of the Big Bang at a very early point. Those four forces can only be manifest when there's matter involved, mass, because because they 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 manifest themselves with the ratio of of strength and how close they are. So the pr the well, well, my my point is that which came first, the law or the matter? Because they're saying the law had to preexist the matter, but you can't. The law doesn't can't manifest itself until the matter exists. So yeah, natural laws obviously infer a lawgiver. Information infers information, you know. Um, a book infers an author. But, but again, we're getting back to the point where he was saying that they walk through the universe, and I don't see any evidence for creation. I say, well, do you see, do you see evidence for information? Well, yeah, everywhere. Where did it come from? Smart people, where did that come from? Um, see, at some point, the source for information, information's in the universe. Everybody acknowledges that. At what point in the universe's history did it emerge? Did it come in? And we're getting to the point in modern physics, realizing that information has to be, like you said, in the natural laws. It has to be in some of the building blocks of the first elements. It has to be, <clears throat> at some point, that information on how to build a universe pre-existed the universe, mind before matter. <clears throat> Bill Gates, biological information is the most important information we can discover because over the next several decades, it will revolutionize medicines and lead to treatments for most diseases. Human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. <clears throat> a causal universe, and a universe of only matter and energy, in, in other words, if they're right, and the universe is nothing but matter and energy, all events are caused by previous events. It's called determinism. In other words, anything that happens was caused by something happening before it. This caused this to happen, caused this to happen. The universe is causal. And if that's the case, we are in a universe that everything that exists right now was caused by something that happened before that. Um, it, it, it means that if there was a Big Bang, the Big Bang led to this collision, led to that collision, led to this, that eventually led to um, 
someone playing the piano. Everything's causal. It's all deterministic. <clears throat> Only intelligence can rise above this determinism. Only intelligence can say, I'm going to do something different than the natural laws. Natural laws are not forcing these words out of my mouth. Laws of chemistry are not forcing the thoughts in your brain. Okay? And if you are an ardent evolutionist and you refuse to believe that, you're then forced to believe, well, all my purpose, all my personality, all my free will is an illusion. Somehow, intelligence emerged from a universe of matter energy and formed the information that we see today, when and how. Intelligence is the ability to choose an order from a list of characters and symbols, the ability to make decisions that are not constrained by the medium, the ability to circumvent the natural order of things by changing what would have happened had no intelligence intervened. Take a large, busy highway, a large, busy intersection, OK? Each car is being driven by an intelligence. Now, you might disagree, but <laughs> for purposes of this argument, you know, an intelligent, there, there is an intelligent agent that's making decisions, each one. If now, we hopefully get to the intersection without chaos because each of those individual intelligences want to live. But if at any moment you removed all the intelligences, all the decision-making ability from those cars, at that point you step back, that's when natural laws take over. All the inertias, all the turning, all the engines, everything else will, will emerge. And in theory, you could predict every, where everything's going to end up. It's called chaos theory, where everything will end up in a predetermined spot. You can't predict it because it's too complex, but it's going to end up there. <clears throat> the ability to make decisions, the ability to choose to turn left or right, to override the natural law of the car, the ability to choose syllables when I'm speaking, the ability to choose what to think about. I mean, there's no way some law of physics tells you what to think about next. We are subverting the natural causal order of the universe when we generate information. When we demonstrate intelligence, when we, we demonstrate the free will gift that God has given us, we are, we're violating the causality of the universe. And the reason I'm putting in those words is I want the atheist to at least understand that free will is impossible and you're a miracle. You are engaged in miraculous supernatural activities when you construct a sentence. Free will. <clears throat> and Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. Why is this verse in the Bible? I'll tell you why. God's showing off. Look what I did. I made information generators just like me. I made decision-making People just like me, yes, this is a universe of matter and energy, but I put something in that universe that is going to be able to name animals entirely on their own. Do I know what they're going to name them? Sure. It's still going to be fun to watch. <laughs> I want to see them function completely as an information, as an agent. Even the atheist is using his God-given gift of free volition every time he forms a sentence. <clears throat> so, what happens when the materialist teaches your children that they are nothing but matter and energy? He's teaching them they have no control over their actions. Any misbehavior is a mechanical issue. I use mechanical as something like a car, but they might say chemical. But and everyone is nothing but their DNA and their inevitable reactions. <clears throat> so, you raise a kid up in the church. Oh, they're happy. They like songs. They like people. They like the Sunday school teacher. And they go to high school, and they're told that, well, you don't need God to explain the universe. And then they start wondering what their purpose in life is. They ask their parents, and the parents say, shut up, read your Bible. You know, um, just, just believe. And your lovey, loving, cute little daughter just goes goth on you all of a sudden. Why? Because mom and dad are lying to them. Mom and dad are saying, there's, a, there's purpose in life, and I know better. What happens to the kid? Yeah, they were, you know, if, if we don't give them a foundation of understanding real purpose, real origins, real creation, you're a creation of God. You, you are, you have, you're in his image. And you have a, a dedicated purpose. You're here, 
if, if you remove the solid basis of free will, it's, it's God's number one institution, and it's under attack constantly. Satan is telling kids everywhere, you can't help it. It drives me nuts. You can't help it. No, you're not an animal. You can't help it. Well, I have a fallen sin nature. Maybe you're right. Um, <clears throat> but the whole idea that free will, I'm, I'm constantly very upset by this latest version of Calvinists that have come out of the woodwork lately. And they're constantly talking about there's no free will. Everything's you know, predestination, that type of stuff. I'm saying the mystics have their fate. The secularists have their determinism. And now you're going to deny us our free volition? That's the one thing we have going for us. That is created as a gift from God. It's always under attack. We teach them that they're animals or machines or stardust, and then we wonder at their anger when something within them demands a more satisfactory answer. We say, go, go do your homework. I don't want to talk to you right now. <clears throat> Creating information requires decision-making and free volition. Now, if information requires an intelligent source, what about information generators? Now, intelligence is required to make this sentence. Now, don't you think an even greater intelligence is required to make something that can make that sentence? Well, one step at a time here. In other words, an in an intelligence can make information. What can make an information generator? We as human beings are information generators. We generate information. We write you know, songs and music, you know, dance. We are creative, and we are made in God's image. So that means that there has to be a higher intelligence to create that information generator. Would the creator of an information generator be more or less intelligent than the generator itself? Obviously more. So if information is in the universe, <clears throat> and it is, and if it requires an intelligent source, and it does, and if we realize that we're information generators ourselves, that means that requires a bigger information a greater intelligence source. So this is the point where I look at the guy, the atheist, and say, you got two choices. Either you have a string of information and intelligences and a higher intelligence and a higher intelligence behind that one. You have an infinite string of greatly increasing higher intelligences, or you have one infinite intelligence. Those are your only two options. <clears throat> okay. Either you're going to be in some sort of, you know, infinite time circle of Hindu deities, <clears throat> or in the beginning, the word created the universe. You are an information generator. You have the ability to make decisions and select sounds, words, letters, and ideas, none of which are forced by any physical or chemical law. Every time you create a sentence, you are overcoming the universe's laws of causality. Free will is supernatural. I have run into atheists who are atheists for this sole reason only. If God knows the future, that means he knows my future. That means my future is predetermined. I don't like that. I do not, I, I, I don't believe in predetermination, predestination. I don't believe in that. I prefer to believe in free will. And you know, I look at that person, I say, I really respect that. I do. You're not, you're not an atheist because you hate God. Not an atheist because you know something happened to your family when you're growing up. You've looked at it and you say, something in me says there's got to be free will. And I don't like the idea of that not being true. It says what you're missing is that free will is very real. But free will can't exist in your universe. Free will is supernatural. And if you really want free will, if you want a universe free will, a universe with free will. It's only the theistic universe that can offer it to you. Now, does God know the beginning from the end? Yes. Does he know ultimately what's going to happen? Yes. But he also doesn't control that. That's so rough. God is so sovereign, he is so in control that he can step back and say, I'm going to let seven billion free wills loose because I'm still in control. And I want to do that to glorify me. And I will get the glory when all the pages are written and everything's done in human history and God demonstrates his total control. <clears throat> um, this little experiment in causality is over with and God's glory is demonstrated. 
people now understand that God is a God of love, a God of mercy, and God of compassion. All these things can happen. And um, <clears throat> I forget the verse number, but in Revelation it says, um, the prior things have all passed away. In the original, the phrase is first things. So I find it very exciting that all of human history, all of creation, all of eschatology is kind of brushed away with the phrase first things. These are the first things. What's coming next is what's really exciting. <clears throat> this is a book written by Roger Penrose. He was trying to write a book on the possible future of artificial intelligence. And he kept trying to find ways to create artificial intelligence. The problem was is that no matter what system was used, you ran into that causality problem. I cannot create something that can overcome that determinism in the universe. He tried everything, multiple universes, quantum physics, and he ended up concluding that we will never have artificial intelligence because we cannot create something that can make independent decisions. And then he had to kind of say, except it obviously has happened at least once with, with us. And again, Roger Penrose basically saying that human free will, either it's an illusion, which we're not willing to accept, some atheists are, <clears throat> or it's, it's the supernatural. Mind precedes matter. There's either infinite succession of ever-increasing intelligence in the universe, or there's a single infinite intelligence. Dedicated evolution must believe, evolutionists must believe there's no purpose, there's no meaning, and no free will. So I'll challenge them. You're, you're an evolutionist, right? Yeah. I says, oh, so you don't believe in free will? Well, yeah, I do, but you can't. Your faith doesn't allow you to. You, there's no purpose. You keep talking about this was meant to do that. No, don't, you can't use the word meant. I say, well, I think it's wicked that you... Nope, nope, that's our word. <laughs> you can't use wicked. There's no such thing in your vocabulary. You're a dedicated evolutionist. You're an atheist. An atheist. If you're going to be true to the tenets of your faith, you're going to have to quit adopting our views. A portion of this was earlier. He says, let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. <clears throat> I can respect the guy. At least he is living consistent with the tenets of his faith. Now, the fact that he wrote that sentence or said that sentence violates that because he just generated information when he said that, right? Um, he also has some purpose. There's no purpose in the universe, but I have a purpose of explaining to people that there's no purpose. Um, he, he cannot, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed. He's coming by as close as anybody does to really adhering to the dictates of his faith. You were created in God's image with the ability to choose, decide, create, and invent. You have an eternal purpose. You have infinite value and meaning. He who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I think that's it. Um, <clears throat> that wraps it up. Um, I just, for me, it's just very important to realize as you walk through this universe, you're an agent, an agent of God. You're a tool also, because you're just a created. You're like a wrench on the shelf. But um, just realizing that you're a created being with, with purpose changes your whole self-image. Um, you know, reason to, reason to live. I was witnessing to this uh, Hindu friend of mine back in college. And he, he was following some of it, and then he wasn't sure what he wanted to do. I looked at him, and I said, you know what? At some point in your life, you're going to make a decision. And the decision is going to be this. Either life isn't worth living, and I'm going to kill myself, or I'm going to accept Jesus Christ. I said, well, why bother otherwise? And he kind of looked at me sort of funny. I've never seen him again. I believe that's true, though. At some point, all of his family had died at the age of 50 for whatever reason. And I know he's still alive today. He's, mid, he's my age. Um, <clears throat> so, but at some point, the, the, the choice is either despair or Christ. 
And when we realize that we are supernatural, we generate information, we violate the universe's causality every time we open our mouths and say something. So does the atheist. He, you know, the atheist, when he speaks, he's, he's magnifying the Lord. He can't help it. I can't fight the flower. It's producing the scent. No matter how much I kick against it, I'm always going to be demonstrating God's creative ability and God's ultimate sovereignty. Amen. Wow. Wasn't that amazing? Thank you very much, John. And uh, uh, we have, um, at least according to um, our schedule, we, we still have 15 minutes uh, if, if you do want to throw out a question or so. Just want to say something. He mentioned the word gift in German means poison. It does in Swedish too, but it also means being married. I'm serious. Gift. Yeah, it means... That. So, um, but uh, anyhow, I, I think it was above and beyond what we expected here because, um, um, I mean, we, not only did we get the uh, scientific side of it, but I think that you tied it in much more than I expected, you know, okay. with, yeah. with all the, I mean, just, uh, you know, the free will. Pastor Schaller, uh, was it two nights ago, he was saying, like, could we sit down and list... Uh, the, the the gifts that we have in the old, you know beginning in the you know Genesis and go and I don't know if anyone mentioned that the free gift maybe we did I, I don't know but I mean it is really a gift because with that gift we can make daily choices to either glorify God or deny Him and that's why I mentioned that this morning you know that I can walk down the street you know with the atheist, and, and that person cannot see God in anything, and, and I can see God everywhere. And, and uh, it, it, it's a mystery in a sense, but, but it made a lot of sense, and, um, and, and um, I loved everything that we heard here. So thank you very much. So do we have one or two questions, something we want to expand on? Um, I, I did want to mention yeah, that... Um, <clears throat> Where my coat is there, I have a stack of papers. It's a little two-sided thing. A additional resources. There's some books and videos mentioned there. Um, there's a little letter C next to the materials that are, blat that are specifically Christian, written by Christian authors. I was going to let, let, let people, um, I was going to let them pick them up as they went out, or if anybody wants one, they can come get it. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Um, but um, Pastor Mike said in, one, in his Sunday morning message was how free will is a prerequisite to love. And um, when you start denying people their God-given creative right to free will, I mean, is love just a chemical reaction? <laughs> you know, that's all it can be. Yeah. You know, you have, especially in Europe, people, I'm in love, I don't know why, I don't know what it means, I don't know, I like, there's no basis for it other than animalistic instinct. And when free will, when I can choose to love my creator, or I can choose to be upset with him, I'm, I'm just glorifying God and using that. And, it's, it's, and going back to my very, very first point, I'm exercising my faith when I do that. I'm living by faith. Job was living by faith when he was mad at God because he was acknowledging God in all his ways. I don't like you made me. You messed up, God. What's your problem? I says, I love it. You're talking to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's just so amazing uh, in the light of this, like you think about all the laws of you know, mathematics and music and colors. And, and, uh, could, you, could you share a little more about all those different, like we, we have these miracles around <coughs> us. Uh, <coughs> Where does music come from, and the, the incredible laws of music and uh, and colors and and materials and it, it, it just a, it's just such a miracle. I, I think the the best way to look at that is being made in God's image. 
God is a giving God. When we give, we're acting like him. God is a creative God. When we create, we're acting like him. We're creating with his thoughts. We're creating, I mean, you can be very creative and be very skillfully creative and have a negative message, right? You can have ugly plays with really good actors. But you're still exhibiting God's creative attributes. Um, I did a whole class on the evidence for a young solar system. And as you go through planet by planet, you go, each one's so different. Each one's completely outside the model of how a planet's supposed to evolve. And at some point, I was struck with the whimsy of God's creation. Oh, let's do one like this. Let's do one like that. And let's, do, let's have a beer with a duck bill on it. It's just, it's not chaotic. It's brilliant. It's very creative. It's very beautiful. And as we exhibit being made in his image, and then more importantly, as we live with his indwelt spirit the way we were designed to, then we will find extreme individuality coming out. I've always said you can't be an individual without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, all I can be is a conformist to either my own self-image, which is going to be way down there, or my peers that I want to try and, try and desperately, desperate, trying to desperately get along with. So, yeah, color is imagination. The variety is endless, and our senses are designed. We have had other classes that look like that. Make sure you look online at the Bible college classes, the summer science classes. We had some sessions on how our senses are designed on purpose to be subjective. They're subjective. You know, are we, when we see a greater intensity of a certain light, our senses readjust to it. We're always leveling it out so we can have greater range of perception. If I start seeing too much green, my brain, my eyes shut off the green receptors so that I don't overload, but then I can enjoy the other colors. We are designed to appreciate. We're not designed, our senses are not designed to, um, to measure, We're not designed to be calculating and cold. Yeah. Hey, Tom. Mm -hmm. and to love him and to love other people. And Absolutely. When I, don't start, when I don't believe in God, then, then I'm just, you know, <clears throat> cross Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says, I am walking to the cross, but somebody's leading me, but I don't know it, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not good. But when I, when I believe in God and I start to learn who he is and what he's done for me and how much he loves me just because he chose to love me, The key word there in that title is let. The key word in that title is let. Let God love you. It's also important to remember that God is not loving us because he has to. Um, some people, it's really sad, but there are people who are saved, they've been in church for a long time, and when they're, they're told that God picked you and, to, and loves you and saved you, they feel like, well, remember back in high school when I was the last one picked for baseball? Team, yeah. Well, God saved me because He had to. He had to <laughs> had to obey His word. He had to do what He said He was going to do, and but He probably would have rather rather not done it. Now that's just evil projection, obviously. But this type of stuff can heal that. This type of stuff can say, "Oh no, He's been pursuing you all along." You know, He He couldn't wait to the day you were born so He could start rolling things out for you. You know, He pre knew you. It's it's very exciting. And, you know, I'm all for the best, most wonderful self-image I can possibly have when it's all based on the cross and agreeing with God. Thoughts from the tree of life, not thoughts from, if my self-image is based on who I am or what I've done, I'm in trouble. And again, like you said, if there's no God, if there's no higher authority to determine what is good and evil, or higher authority to determine um, why I'm here, it's, it's pretty miserable. Uh, yes, sir. I, uh, Joan, I, I kind of feel there were parts in your presentation while I was in and out of the room that uh, if we could stop there, like as a group, like a discussion group or something, 
and really work that mm -hmm. material a little bit, we could come up with like, as pastors maybe, like really we could work on messages, we could work on things because some of this is so profound mm -hmm. and it's, um, it could speak to the, uh, you know, the unbeliever. It can also speak to the person searching and also the young people who will be in the university and be challenged. Right. And these are great, great, uh, this is an excellent presentation, you know. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how that will happen. What's the program for tonight? Uh, we have three uh, classes, as always. Yep. And actually, um, Pastor Philip will be involved doing two of them. Okay. I will do one. So, okay. Uh, it's pretty much his night there, but I mean, we can... Yeah, no, that'll be good. We want to do that. Yeah. And then uh, then tomorrow, what's uh, in the morning is the uh, program. Tomorrow is um, eschatology Sorry. day. Uh, <laughs> is eschatology? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, John, I guess it just means that um, in the future, we'll figure out something. Sure. Yeah. And then um, I think our brothers are here until uh, Saturday. And then basically it's over. Our masters, but that was a great uh, oh, thank you. presentation. We can work on things in the future. Thanks so much, Pastor Dev Andre does the lunch wrap today, and uh, I don't want to cut it off. Pastor Toll, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor Toll. It's yep. awesome to be working with you.